let's begin talking about ethics. Now, we have a class here called Worldviews and Ethics. I don't know how they define ethics in that class, but for the sake of these 30 minutes, we're just going to give this simple definition for ethics. Ethics is the branch of philosophy that constitutes what is right and what is wrong. So when we look at a scenario, we say, okay, well, that's, that's okay, that's not. That's acceptable, that's unacceptable. The branch of philosophy that constitutes what is right and what is wrong. So it basically deals with our values. And there are three approaches that you can, can take to making ethical decisions when it comes to public speaking. The first is what's called a universal truth approach. Now, I like thinking of, of these approaches as, as layers of a filter. You could look at them as three different approaches and you gotta pick one, but I think they work best in conjunction with one another. So here's, here's how it works. I'm just gonna put the truth up here. So here's how it works. In this grid, you start here. And you start with the first approach. The first approach is, does God say anything about this? Does it pass the universal truth test? Is there a, thus saith the Lord, on the matter? If it passes the universal truth test, then you bring it down to the next grid. But what if... What if you're looking at the issue, and so you're thinking, you know what, I'm just going to, in my sermon or in my speech, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell this story as if it happened to me, but in reality, it didn't. So I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fib a little bit. Is there a thus saith the Lord? Yeah, like, don't lie. It's been there from the very beginning. So it doesn't pass the test. So what you do if it doesn't pass the test, you just kick it out. And, and you don't do that. So that's universal truth. Is there a thus saith the Lord? Has God said anything about this matter? The second approach is the unto others approach. Kind of the, the golden rule thing. Do unto others as you would have them do to you. So, if you were an audience member, would you want your listener, or would you want the speaker to do that, to say that, to treat you in that particular way? If the answer is, yeah, I'm fine with that, then it passes the test, and it goes down to the next layer. If you get to this layer, and you think, you know what, I, I don't think I would be comfortable with that if I were an audience member, then you kick it out, and you don't attempt it. If it's past these first two layers of the filter, then you get to the third level, which is called the utilitarian benefit. A big fancy word that basically means there is greater gain than the alternative. So I've got two options here. I can choose option one, option two. Both have passed these first two tests. So then you're asking which one accomplishes greater good in my speech or in my sermon. And then you, you, you say, if, if this one has greater good, then I'm going to choose it. If it doesn't, then you kick it out. And then once it passes all three of these, then you say, okay, I, I can do this. Now here's, here's what's realistic. You're never going to do this. You're never going to write this chart out and ask yourself a question about, okay, should I play this video clip? Let's check. God say anything about it? Okay, okay, okay. You're not going to draw out that, that grid. I know that. But what should happen is you ought to be able, kind of in an instant, to have this in your brain, where you can just kind of filter it, even, even subconsciously, where you're just kind of thinking, okay, God hasn't said anything bad about that. I'm okay with that. It would serve a purpose. Boom, we got it. 
you ought to be able to do that kind of real quick without having to draw anything out and just kind of second nature to you. So let's, let's try this with a couple examples. So here's case study number one, example number one. So you tell a story. Oh, I forgot I, forgot I had that one in there. Tell a story as if it actually happened to you when in reality it didn't. So you're preaching, you're, you're up on, in chapel, and you, you use this sermon illustration that you heard from some other preacher, and it actually happened to him, but you think, you know, it has, it has a greater effect if I pretend like it happened to me. And so you tell it as if it happened to you. So you start off with test number one. So I've already kind of answered that for one. Is there a thus saith the Lord on the matter? Yeah, God says don't lie. So if we were using this grid, we would kick it out, and we, we wouldn't do that. But let's say hypothetically that it passed that first grid. So then we come to the unto others level. So if you were an audience member, would you want a speaker telling you a story as if it happened to them when in reality it didn't? Would you like that? Probably not. So if somehow it made it through the first grid, you kick it out at the second grid. But let's say hypothetically that it makes it through both layers and gets down here to the utilitarian benefit. Does it provide greater benefit than if you leave it out? Let's say it's a, it's a good illustration and it ties in really well with the point you're trying to make. See, sometimes what happens, something doesn't pass an upper layer grid, but it could still pass down here. I think this is a good illustration. This could actually pass this grid, but it doesn't matter because it's already been kicked out. So even if something passes at a lower level, you still don't use it because it's already been disqualified above. So the idea is this one has the trump card on anything else. This one trumps this one. And the only way that you would even come to this is if it's already passed these first two. So, so even if something passes the final test, if it hasn't passed the ones above it, it doesn't matter. But, but just for hypothetical, hypothetical case, we wanted to go ahead and kind of run it through that grid. Now let's try a second example. You include a personal story. This is, this is later on in life. You now have a family. You're married with children. And for the ladies in the room, just, just replace wife with husband. Okay, so you're in a situation where you're, you're preaching, giving a devotion, sharing a testimony, maybe giving a lesson. And as a part of this, this lesson time, you share a personal story about your family. Well, run it through the grid. Is there a thus saith the Lord? Like, does God ever say, thou shalt not tell a story about your family? No, it, does, it, it passes the universal truth test. What about the unto others? As a listener, do you enjoy hearing stories when, when, when a preacher tells a personal story about his family that ties into the sermon? Most people generally like hearing those kind of stories. So usually that's going to pass the unto others. Are there situations in which that kind of a story would not pass the unto others? Maybe it's a story that makes your family look bad, but makes you look good. They might not want to hear that one. Okay, that's a good example. Are there other situations in which a personal story about your family might not pass this test? You guys ever been to a church that has a singles ministry? Okay, let's say you're in a singles ministry with a bunch of 30-year-old singles. Guess what their ambition is in life? most of them, to have a family. You begin your sermon with a personal story about how great it is to be married and have, have a family. Is that a good idea? Probably not in that setting. So in that particular setting, it might not pass the unto others approach. So sometimes this depends on your audience. This depends on the particular setting you're going to be in. Generally speaking, would this pass? Yeah. In chapel, is that going to pass? Yeah. Most students respond pretty well when a professor or something tells a personal story about their family. But there might be settings in which this doesn't pass. So let's say we're in a setting in which this passes. So we, we take it down here to the utilitarian benefit. Does it benefit the sermon to have that story in there? 
more than not having it in there. Probably that's, that's why you were thinking about having it in there in the first place, is because you think it connects well, it draws in your audience, it makes the point for you pretty well, so it probably passes that test. So if it's passed all three of these layers, then you go, yay, it's passed the ethical test, I can use it. And that one probably would in most situations. Third example, in class, you're giving your speech, but you need some volunteers. And instead of talking to people ahead of time, saying, hey, could I get your help uh, at this particular thing? Here's what I'm going to need from you. In the middle of your speech, you just demand people come up and participate. Let's run that through the grid. So you're forcing audience members to participate in your speech. Universal truth? Has God said anything about that? Don't force people to interact? No. So it passes that one. Unto others? If you were an audience member, would you want to be forced to come up on stage without any notice? Most of you probably don't. Most of you want a little bit of a heads up. So it would probably get kicked out here. But let's hypothetically say that it goes down to the utilitarian benefit. Does it provide greater benefit than if you leave it out? Well, it might. But could there be other ways you could go about it? Like maybe talking to your classmates ahead of time and asking permission, that might provide greater benefit. And it would be even greater benefit if you tell your classmates, hey, I've asked Ian if he would help me out in this next moment. So Ian, could you come forward? And even a simple statement like, I asked Ian, deflects a lot of nervousness. Because what happens if your audience thinks Ian was not prepared. They stop thinking about your speech, and they start thinking about, you know what, I don't, I don't think Giselle asked Ian. That was kind of rude of her. And they completely forget what you're talking about. Same thing happens in preaching. Like, th think about a preacher who tells a story from a counseling session. I mean, that's generally a no-no. Like, you don't break confidence. Somebody comes into your office, says, hey, my marriage is on the rocks, can you help? And then you get up Sunday morning, and you say, hey, Tom was in my office on Monday, and man, his marriage is a mess. You know that? You don't do that. But what if you had gone to Tom and said, hey, look, what you shared with me, I think there are a lot of couples in the church who are in the same spot. Would it be okay if Sunday morning... I used you guys as an illustration. And Tom says, absolutely, that is okay. If it can be a benefit to this church, then use my story. But then you get up Sunday morning and you tell Tom's story, but you don't mention that you got Tom's approval. Then what does everybody else in the room start thinking? I'm never going to the preacher with a problem because Sunday morning he will air my dirty laundry. So just a simple statement. I asked Tom's permission deflects a lot of the problem. So even something simple like that, if Giselle were to say, I asked Ian for his permission to come up here, so Ian's going to help me out. Something simple like that is a, is a good thing to do. All right, so those are three examples of using the grid. So you see how the grid works? Just kind of run it through the, run it through the filter test, those three layers. That's a basic approach. All right. Why do we care about ethics? Well, ethics, number one, is designed to protect the government and the public. So, for instance, the government has a right to restrict speech that is considered a clear and present danger. So, how, how do ethics and government relate to public speaking? Well, this would be one area. So, somebody's in a, a movie theater. It is considered a clear and present danger in a packed movie theater for somebody to stand up and yell, you know what? You know what word? Fire. Yeah, you, you, you cannot in a packed movie theater stand up and yell, fire. You are not protected under freedom of speech to do that because it is considered a clear and present danger to the public to do that. So it is restricted. So that ethical issue is designed to protect the public. 
It can also restrict speech that has a tendency, which is kind of a vague word, tendency to cause trouble to the public or the government. So that's kind of uh, wide open. So first and foremost, ethics are designed to protect the government as well as the public. Secondly, ethics is designed to protect individual rights. Your rights, my rights, everybody's rights. It protects us from defamation. Defamation is simply making a statement that falsely or unjustifiably hurts a person's reputation. Highlight the word unjustifiably. Notice it says falsely or unjustifiably. So you could actually be telling a half-truth about the individual, but still be guilty of defamation because you embellished the case in such a way that you unjustifiably hurt that person's reputation. So how does defamation show up in public speaking? Well, let's say you're given a biographical speech. So you're given an informative speech on a particular individual. And you could just exclusively focus on the bad of that individual and not even mention anything good about him. Even though, even the worst characters probably have some redeeming characteristics. If you were to do a biographical study on Adolf Hitler, are you going to find a lot of very bad characteristics about his life? Absolutely. Guess what you would also find? You would find a lot of redeeming characteristics about Adolf Hitler. And so if in your speech you ignore the good things, as few as they may be, and only focus on the bad, then you're not really giving the entire picture. And so what you want to do as a speaker is give the entire picture. Don't do what you see in political campaign ads, where they just use smear tactics and just bash the other person, never mentioning anything good. There are two types of defamation. There is slander, which is spoken defamation. This is the one that you guys have to be aware of in a speech class. You have to be careful that you don't unjustifiably hurt somebody's reputation in a verbal way. So think, just, just think the S's. Slander, spoken. The other type is libel, which is written defamation. So in a book, in a blog, in, in, a, in an essay. But for this class, you're going to be more concerned about slander than, than libel. So, protects government or public rights, also protects individual rights. Thirdly, ethics helps protect intellectual rights. Helps us protect intellectual rights. Intellectual property is the intangible product of thought and creativity. This is when ethics gets really, really blurry and hazy when it comes to intellectual property. And chances are, you have all violated somebody's intellectual property. Because chances are you have music on your computer, on your phone, on, on some device that you did not legally purchase. Is that true? Most of you, I would assume. I, I, I do. Most of us have some intellectual property that we did not acquire by legal means. We weren't intentionally breaking the law. We weren't intentionally violating their intellectual rights, but we had access to it and we got it. And it gets really, really hazy, really, really difficult in some of these matters. It, the, the laws are, are being revised and rewritten pretty much every few years to help kind of kind of wrestle through some of these new new forms of media and you know what is protected, what is not protected, how do we make sure that that somebody's intellectual rights are are protected? So a basic way to 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 avoid violating somebody's intellectual rights when it comes to to speeches is making sure that you cite sources. So if you are quoting from a musician, like from a song, or if you play a clip from a song, 
you got to at least cite the source. That's the bare minimum you have to do. In some settings, even though you, you don't necessarily have to do that in an academic environment like, or in an educational environment because there's a lot that falls under uh, kind of an educational umbrella that you can get away with that you couldn't get away with in other settings. So for instance, you can probably get away with playing a, a clip from a movie in here without asking the, the movie company for their permission. In a church, you cannot do that. You cannot legally show a clip from a movie without getting their permission. So you have to contact like MGM Studios or you got to contact Pixar if you want to use a clip from Finding Nemo. Finding Nemo. Finding Nemo. Not 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 Neymar, the Brazilian soccer player, but Nemo, the fish. So like if you want to show a clip from Finding Nemo, the, the only way to make sure that you don't violate somebody's intellectual rights is contacting Pixar and saying, "Hey, I would like to use this clip from 4 minutes and 27 seconds in to 6 minutes and 14 seconds in." Is that okay? And they will then send you some written permission or say, no, you may not. And if, if you use it without permission, you can get sued. And you, you don't want your church to get sued. That would be bad. Um, especially if it's something like Pixar coming at you. They could, they could make your church cease to exist very easily. And then you've then you got to think about it even, there's another layer to it if your church streams or podcasts. Because now it's not just asking permission to show it live. Now you're asking permission to have that clip in some sort of, of cloud that can be downloaded perpetually. Then you've got to have an added layer of permission. So it, it, gets, it gets a little bit tricky when you're going that route. But for this class, you don't have to do that because you're covered under educational stuff. So because it's educational, you're allowed to use that without getting permission. I would still suggest, if, if you think about it, you might contact them just to get some practice with that if you're going to use a video clip. Even if you can find it on YouTube. Just because you can find something on YouTube doesn't mean the individual had the legal rights to put it on there. And certainly doesn't mean that we have the legal rights to use it without asking permission from the, original, the originator of that material. This is one of the most difficult things about like preaching and teaching just thinking through all of the intellectual rights stuff that legally you have to.